How relevant is your parliament? A new report from the Samara think tank suggests Canadians don't feel their elected representatives represent their interests very well at all. Joining us now for more on the report, Alison Lowe. She's executive director of Samara, and it's, as always, good to have you back here at TVO. Very nice to be here. Let's share some of your numbers, shall we, just to get started here? Let's bring this up, control room. Uh, how many people do you think say they're satisfied with the state of democracy in Canada? 55% a very low number. How many people think Ottawa deals with their issues? Just 27%. How about MP's score for representing constituents' views? 44%. Can you just start by telling us, uh, in terms of uh, historical perspective, how high or low those numbers feel? Well, on the first one, the overall satisfaction with Canadian democracy, that number, unfortunately, is the lowest that, since that, num that question has ever been asked. Um, so that isn't great news, although if you... That isn't great news? That's terrible news, I think, is what you meant to say. Well, some, yes, there is yeah. a, a slightly optimistic twist, which someone pointed out to me that's worth repeating, which is that it might suggest that Canadians actually care enough um, about their democracy to be that concerned about it and want to do something different. Um, the other two numbers, though, those are the first times that they've been asked, and they're research that we commissioned at Samara out of um, just trying to pick up on a lot of what we hear through the work that we do in communities. And number, one of the biggest complaints people have about Parliament is that it doesn't represent the issues that matter to them. So we thought it would be worth analyzing that and seeing if that, that uh, stereotype is true. And what'd you find out? Uh, well, we looked at the Hansard from 2012 and analyzed it for the subjects that MPs talk about and then compared to what Canadians uh, identified as their most important issues. And what we found out is that although the alignment is not fabulous, it is a little bit better than Canadians might think. Um, the number one issue uh, facing that Canadians are concerned about, the economy and jobs, is also one of the number one issues that Parliament uh, tackled in 2012. Does that mean it came up a lot in question period or debates on bills or what? Yeah, we looked across all venues. So I think as uh, anyone probably watching this show knows, we spend most of our time on question period uh, mm -hmm. in the media. But uh, question period is only about 45 minutes of a full day in the House of Commons. So we thought it would be interesting to widen that a little bit and look what el at what else MPs are talking about. Um, there were other interesting things that emerged, though, from that. Um, for example, one of the findings that may be relevant to the discussion we'll have after is that the venues where MPs were less scripted by their political parties, like private members' business, were more aligned to what uh, Canadians cared about than those that were more heavily uh, dictated by parties. So that was also a really interesting finding. Is that an encouraging finding as far as you're concerned? Well, I am discouraged when political parties who are meant to represent uh, citizens' views mm. to their politics uh, are seen as being contradictory uh, to uh, constituents' mm. perspectives. So I think there's probably a little something to tease out there. Gotcha. Your report says at one point that, quote, it's very possible that Canadians intuitively sense that the House is a shell game. Are you concerned that we are, if not at the point, getting to the point where Canadians see Parliament and they just think it's irrelevant? Uh, I am concerned about that very much. Um, it, there's a funny paradox because Parliament has never been more accessible to Canadians than it is today. Accessible in what sense? Well, you can find out, you can watch on television and see what's happening. You can uh, follow bloggers like one we'll have uh, speaking shortly to see what's going on uh, in the House of Commons. There's a, uh, MPs are on Twitter. They're very active in trying to communicate with the public. So we've never had a more accessible public discourse at the same time that I fear it is seen as being less and less relevant. And this uh, was something echoed by the MPs that we spoke to in an exit interview project we did with them, mm -hmm. uh, where um, you know, one MP said, you know, the House of Commons has a monopoly on the waste of time. All the real decisions are taking place away from the floor of the House of Commons. And on one hand, you think, okay, well, I can get that. Imagine 308 people trying to make a decision in one room kind of feels a bit funny. Um, but at the other hand, that is supposed to be Canada's central venue for debate and discussion and decision making. And if that is something that the very MPs are not seeing as working, then uh, I wouldn't be surprised that Canadians uh, also uh, think it could maybe be serving us better. Well, why don't we broaden the discussion because we've invited a bunch of other folks who actually spend a lot more time in the House of Commons than either you or I do. Yep. Poor them. <laughs> uh, no, I don't mean that. Here we go. Let's broaden the discussion. How well does the House of Commons address the concerns of Canadians? We're going to find out now more in Edmonton, Alberta, from Brent Rathgaber. He's the Conservative MP for Edmonton St. Albert. In the nation's capital, there's Nathan Cullen, the NDP MP for Skeena Bulkley Valley. And back here in studio, Carolyn Bennett, who's the Liberal MP for the Riding of St. Paul's. Aaron Wary, the parliamentary reporter for McLean's Magazine, and of course, Alison Lote from Samara is going to stick around and help us with this as well. Okay, let's, let's stir the pot a bit here, shall we? Aaron, I'm going to come to you first. I want you to tell us the story about the Member of Parliament from Langley, 
who has got the whole issue of how much members can represent their constituents' views and interests really in the crosshairs of our dialogue right now. What's the story? Well, I guess a few things have happened sort of with Mark Warwa over the last couple of weeks. First of all, he, he has been pursuing this motion which would have had the House condemn sex-selective abortion. So that had to first go through a subcommittee uh, to be deemed votable, essentially. Um, and it was, by that committee, ruled out of order on what I would suggest are fairly flimsy grounds. Uh, so first of all, his motion was set aside. And then second of all, he attempted to stand up during the time specifically reserved for statements by members to speak to that motion. And his whip, uh, his party whip told him he couldn't do that. And he said that because why? Uh, essentially because they, I mean, you'd have to infer a bit, but essentially because the Conservative Party doesn't want to be talking about abortion. And Mr. Warwa does want to talk about abortion. And the party whip controls who gets to stand up during those 15 minutes to speak. So Mr. Warwa has essentially brought several issues up in the course of this. But the, the, the real heart of the matter, the essential issue, the essential debate is to what degree are MPs independent from their parties and are, to what degree is Parliament independent of the executive and of the government? Let's pursue that. It's a very good question. Brent, let's go to you first uh, in Edmonton and get you to weigh, on in, weigh in on that. How much do you think um, Mark Warwa was entitled to do what he wanted to do and how much of this is you're on a team, you got to follow what the coach says? Well, certainly there's a constant balancing act that, that has to be followed. But I think with respect to the SO31s or the, or the one-minute the one minute member statements prior to question period, the rules are quite clear that a member may speak on any topic of local, national, provincial, international importance to him or, or to his constituents. And in that, in that specific instance, um, I and other members of our caucus and, and Nathan Collin, I believe, uh, defended his right to make a, a, a speech on any topic that he wanted, uh, re, uh, provided that it fell within the 60 seconds and then it uh, wasn't defamatory. And the rules are quite clear that it's only the speaker that can uh, force a member to take his seat if the rules are not complied with. So in that specific instance, regardless of how you feel about the topic of, of sex selective pregnancy termination, I vehemently defend uh, Mr. Warwa or any member's right to speak for 60 seconds on a, on a topic that's important to him or her. Nathan Cullen, let me get you on this. My hunch is that you disagree vehemently with his position on this, but how about his right to actually say it on the floor of the House? Yeah, th thanks, Steve, for making that distinction because the, the issue of a woman's right to choose as a new Democrat, I feel that is a, that is a fundamental right that, that needs to be reinforced and established on the specifics of Mr. Warwa's ability to stand up as any MP does, the, the, the list of statements is something that is either depends on how the party handles it. I can only speak to how the NDP does it. And we have a, a randomized list. Everyone gets the same number of statements. And you get a minute to talk about usually something going on in your constituency, an issue that you think is important, or to commemorate some anniversary that may be uh, internationally significant. What's changed is that the, with the Conservatives in power, there's been a lot more attention given to the discipline of the message and control over what's happening when MPs are standing up to speak. And that's crept into these, what were generally speaking, relatively innocuous, not attention-grabbing uh, 15 minutes before question period, so that Conservative MPs are regularly getting up and uh, continuing to the, the mistruths or whatever the spin of the day coming out of the Prime Minister's office. And that's where the individual rights of an MP and the obligation to the team, to the party, are starting to really face some tension and stress, particularly within the Conservative caucus right now. Okay, we're going to do our best to have as nonpartisan a discussion as we can today, because this is not meant to oh. be a no, let's Steve, pick on I, the Conservatives. I, I, but, and, and I do for, want to forgive me. I, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, that, that wasn't meant to, I, I apologize if that came across as a partisan uh, thing. I, uh, like I said, I can only talk about how the NDP goes through and we don't vet the statements that come out. I, I'm, I'm only... Uh, responding to the evidence that was presented by Mr. Warrow and, and others of his colleagues in the House as to what process goes on in the Conservatives uh, when they're picking those statements and what's being allowed to talk about and not. And that, that's, that seems to be the source of the tension going on right now for them internally. I don't, I'm not trying to suggest that the, uh, anything beyond that, but that's, a, that's apparently what the public's looking at, and that's why we're having this discussion today. Okay, fair enough. But now let's get some historical perspective from you, Carolyn Bennett, because you would have been a member of the Liberal government and not in Cabinet once upon a time. And I wonder how much attention was paid by the whip or the leader's office back then to have you say not necessarily what you wanted, but what they wanted. Um, I don't think that ever happened. I think 
member statements were member statements and you got to and private members business was private members business and you you know i mean it may be the reason that liberals always have looked so messy uh, but we we actually really did uh, um, say this was somebody in my riding turned 100 and i think that's pretty terrific and i want to do a member statement about it i mean now because we've only got two a day um, the whip is trying to make sure that we we are covering off the things that have been requests uh, for us, whether it's a, uh, a death or, uh, uh, um, as, as Nathan said, uh, you know, national day of whatever. Um, but I think that, that the, the big snap of the rubber band that happened two weeks ago was because there had been a giving over of private member statements to issues um, debasing leaders, uh, that the PMO was writing some of the member statements, it, it seems clear, and others have told us, in the same way as they were disguising government bills in through the back door of either a Senate bill or a private member's bill. So, uh, you know, somehow that was willingly given over for a while until this big snap happened, which was, wait a second, boys and girls, the Prime Minister promised this in an election campaign. Now, this isn't quite the same as John Nunziata voting against a budget, but the Prime Minister promised this. We're going to own, we're going to own that promise. You ran and maybe had a whole bunch of votes come your way because people were frightened about this abortion issue, were frightened about this, and they weren't going to vote conservative if they thought this was being reopened. The Prime Minister made a promise, and that's why this is so murky, um, because I think it is about free speech, and they should be allowed to say anything they well, they let's, want. Let's clarify. But that. I also think that you know that the the conservatives are worried that they can't have everybody off um, to, breaking the prime minister's promise because this could go down to actually reopening the debate, reop and and a vote in the House of Commons. The opposite of what the prime minister promised. Okay, Brent, can, can we just get, let me square the circle here and go back to Brent for a second to to have his conclusion on this. D can you tell us where this sits right now in terms of whether or not you believe the prime minister's office and the whip's office is in fact allowing people in those private member statements to say what private members want to say or not? Well, I mean. I think it's been well publicized that with respect to Mr. Warwa, he was not able to deliver his SO31 on the topic that he wanted to. Um, I've never had an SO31 um, rejected, although I have had to submit them from time to time for vetting. So I, I think that's well understood that the vetting process does occur. And I just want to respond briefly to something uh, Nathan Collins said. I think when, when the Reform and the Canadian Alliance were in opposition, uh, certainly they were on the forefront of democratic reform and members' rights, but certainly when you get into government, there's a greater attempt to try to control the messaging. And uh, so I, I think as opposition parties, they're afforded a, a little more liberty. But when you when you become government, I think the, the Prime Minister's office and the House Leader's office has an inclination to try to control the messaging. But to answer your question, Steve, y yes, it was, it was the inability of Mr. Warwa to deliver his member statement that caused the concern of I and others who are not necessarily identified uh, with with the pro-life movement. But to, to us it became a members' rights issue and, and a member of uh, a freedom of speech issue. So uh, Mark uh, appealed to the speaker. I and others spoke in favor of his privilege motion. So it, we're now waiting, anxiously awaiting for the speaker's ruling to determine whether or not it is proper to have your House Leader's office vet the SO31s before they're presented on the floor of the House of Commons. And let me just get Aaron to come in at this point and tell us whether or not the point that Brent just made there, that it, it's different when you're the government. Opposition MPs can say basically whatever they want. When you're the government, there is a sense that this is part of our message, our brand. Would you acknowledge that and therefore they have different standards they have to live up to? For sure. I, it, I think we have to allow for a certain amount of, uh, I guess, consistency of messaging. Uh, but the problem is that you get to a point where you don't have MPs anymore. You just have these sort of robots who spit out talking points. To me, you know, I have no polling data to back this up, but I would suggest that the, the real disconnect between Parliament and, and politicians and the people is the talking point. It's this nothing statement, and it is the repetition of that statement over and over and over again with sort of no uh, sincere 
uh, intellect behind it. It's just a script. Who's the most appalling practitioner of this in Ottawa today? Well, I'm not going to point fingers of blame. It's, 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 it's shared on all sides, I'll be completely honest. You know, Nathan talked about the Conservatives and the way they've used member statements, and, and by all means, they, they have to take a bit of responsibility for the situation. But the NDP's response to that has been to sort of edge up to that a bit and to start using their member statements to go after the Conservatives. And so you get into this. And it is the game, and, and you know that's how it has to be played to a certain extent. But we get to this point where we have to kind of decide what we want these people to be doing and what we want them to be talking about and how we want Parliament to work. Well, and that takes me, that takes me to Alison, because I, I wonder whether through any of your exit interviews with MPs or any of the surveying that you've done through Samara, you have a sense of what the public wants on this. My, my hunch is the public, they want their members there representing them, but they also need to understand when I vote Conservative, this is what I'm getting, or when I'm voting NDP, this is what I'm getting. So do you know where they are on this? I think there's a couple things at play. I mean, when you ask Canadians, uh, we, which we've done, um, about why they feel so uh, dissatisfied with democracy, one of the big reasons is that they feel that their MPs are representing their political party at the expense of citizens. Um, and that goes back to something I said earlier, which to me, I think it's unfortunate if we, as the Canadian population, see political parties at, at odds with Canadians' interests. Um, they are the organizations that are supposed to aggregate citizens' perspectives and choose people to run for office and engage people in politics. And <laughs> at least polling is suggesting that it's seen as diametrically opposed to citizens. So I worry about that, given the importance of political parties and, frankly, how hev heavily we support them with our tax dollars. Uh, but there's a second issue at play, and that goes and picks up on something Aaron said, which is what is the role of an MP in 21st century democracy? Mm -hmm. Uh, we asked uh, MPs when we, we conducted a series of exit interviews with now 79 MPs that served for about 10 and a half years on average, so experienced folk. And we said, what's the job of an MP? Basic warm-up question. And we had about as many answers as we did people. And very few of them, uh, in fact only two, mentioned what is the essential role of an MP, which is to hold government to account. And that's independent of which political party you're in. Uh, but of course, that is that does rub against, as, as uh, our MPs have said, the challenges of being a member of a political party and modern political communications. And so how that's reconciled and how MPs choose to define their own role, I think, is really critical. Because if they themselves are contradicting each other and, and confused mm -hmm. about what essentially is the exact same job, you can't blame the public for being confused about what they're seeing going on. Nathan Cullen, this is a dilemma that I guess you have to live with every day. You're there in the House as a new Democrat, but theoretically, you're mm -hmm. also there to rep represent the interests of the, I don't know what it is, 100,000 or so people that you represent in British Columbia. Where, where yeah, does the balance not, fall? Not, it, here's the particular pleasure and honor that I have. It's not theoretical for me. The place and the people that I represent in northern British Columbia uh, let me know uh, in, incredibly clearly <laughs> when they think that I've not represented <laughs> them well. How do they Allison's do that? Allison's right. I mean, I'm, oh, uh, yeah, I don't know if you've been to northern BC, but folks there are, while polite, incredibly direct with their elected representatives, and that's nice. I also, anyway, I, I think Allison's, something she raised earlier, which is spot on, is that there's a huge opportunity going on right now that because of the opening through social media and our telecommunications, there, there is an ability to access in different ways, and I would suggest that we as parties and MPs have not yet fully achieved what it can be. I would also suggest that when parties, I heard an interview with Preston Manning, and he talked about the early days of reform, and he said we were much more open. He sat in the second row, and MPs kind of said whatever they wanted, and he faced heavy, heavy criticism for not being focused or disciplined and just too randomized. So it's and that, that sometimes came out of the media, sometimes out of the public. So you can't have it both ways. Carolyn talked about it being a bit messy. Well, democracy ideally is a bit messy, but any mistake made today, by mistake I mean someone uh, saying something just stupid and wrong, or if somebody intentionally goes out against the team, it gets amplified much larger than it ever has before in our history. And so parties, of course, are wary of that because you lose those days. You don't get to talk about the initiatives of the government or the opposition because now you're talking about Mark Warwa and his feelings about making a statement that I would suggest the vast majority of the public didn't even know happened every day. And now we're talking about them because it's become a symbol 
of what you do get if you vote conservative or you vote NDP or you vote liberal. And mm. I think that wash over into what our role is, the, the primary role, Allison's absolutely right. I think there's a second one. We speak on behalf of our constituents and we hold government to account. And that shouldn't know partisan boundaries, but unfortunately, uh, sometimes it does. Carolyn Bennett, that, that is a fair point, isn't it? You can't just go off and say anything you want because it doesn't just reflect on you. It will reflect on your party and your leader will have to come out and either defend you or punish you or something like that. So. There is no perfect free speech in the House, and that's probably fair, right? No, it's sort of freedom within a framework. The fa mm -hmm. framework is values. It's it's past record. It, uh, I mean, we. It's not a place for, for rebellion, um, but it is a place with expectations. But I think the expectation that we are missing in a modern parliament is the expectation to be in touch in a representative democracy of being a representative. And I don't think we've kept up with the modern technology or, you know, I I've teasingly have put up on a wiki a private member's bill on mandatory minimums for citizen engagement because <laughs> I think that, What's that? That, <laughs> that, you know, it begins with the in, in Environmental Protection Act, but that there, whether you're a, uh, an MP in the constituency, whether you're a critic, whether you're a member of a committee, a minister, a government department or a PMO, there should be a mandatory minimum for how much you've consulted and how much you've listened. And, and if in the best possible parliament, I would be reflecting back all the time what I've heard um, online, in my writing, but, but particularly in this rather bizarre majority government where 60% of people didn't vote for these people. And so it becomes very difficult, I think. Um, and, and I think with Allison's study, even when we go to committees, that used to be the best of Parliament, um, that we're seeing stuff rammed through, hunks of testimony taken out of a report. And it's not surprising that even the really engaged citizens who actually came to Parliament and testified at a committee opens up the report and doesn't see anything that, of their testimony in that report. And so I, I think we've, we've got to get going on the democracy between elections which would be a really serious engagement with mechanisms such that MPs can do our job better and that we then have ground, you know, crowdsourcing of the estimates, the performance. I mean, the, the people who really care about a particular part can look at it with me as I do now with the Aboriginal community. I couldn't do my job as critic without having all of them helping me. Let me ask Brent to, just to comment on that. Brent, could you, could you come in and tell us whether you think the status, I know that you've had a caucus meeting subsequent to all of this happening, and from all accounts it was a, a pretty good exchange of views both ways, but do you have a good sense now about just how much free speech your members are allowed to engage in right now? Well, no, because I think, that, like I indicated earlier, I think the question, certainly regarding the SO31s, the member statements, is currently before the Speaker, and I, and I think his thoughts and his uh, ruling with respect to Mr. Warwa's privilege breach, I think, will set a very important precedent on a go-forward basis as to whether or not the members do, in fact, have the right to speak openly and freely on anything. No, they but want I know. Let whether, me, forgive my interruption here. I just want to let me let me just interrupt for a second, only to say I know that in that caucus meeting, some of you folks who were more pro-free speech in the House went to the Prime Minister and went to the Whip and said, "Look, we have to be able to do this." And I wonder whether you got an understanding from the PM that he agrees or he gets it or what? Well, I, I mean, I'm still of the view that the party machinery, the party mechanism, would like to have considerable control over messaging. Um, there are those, who, those of us who spoke in the House after that caucus meeting because we're defending the rights of members to speak freely. And I mean, I, to, and I agree with most of what uh, Dr. Bennett had to say. And, and I really think it's a sign of a mature democracy where we can have these types of disagreements without it evolving into a full-scaled revolt as uh, the, the media tried to uh, use the characterize what was happening in our caucus. And I, and I dispute that. I think it's healthy to have to have discourse which occasionally borders on uh, on disagreement. You, you look at other other mature democracies, you look to the south where you have bipartisan votes all the time, including the one that uh, avoided the fiscal cliff on New Year's Eve where you have both Democrats and Republicans voting for the budget bill and voting against the budget bill and you have disagreements uh, within the caucuses and that's not uh, the sign of a of a, an, uh, of a disruptive or dysfunctional democracy, I would say quite the opposite. I think, I believe, and I've written this, <laughs> that a, a member of parliament 
is to hold the government to account. And that applies both to the government backbenches and to the opposition benches. So you can have a disagreement with your party from time to time w without it being, you know, forming some sort of constitutional crisis. And, and, I, and I agree with Dr. Bennett, specifically with respect to committees, and we sit, both sit on the Aboriginal Affairs Committee, that uh, you have to break away from the, the strict party messaging from time to time if you're going to do your job in vetting a government bill or vetting a private member's bill to try to either pass it or fail it or more likely try to make a good bill, even, even a better bill by, by uh, doing improvements on the margins. Okay, Andrew Coyne has weighed in on this. Sorry for quoting the competition here, Aaron, but here we go. Here's what he had to say and then we'll come back and chat. People like me, he writes, are inclined to look for structural causes in cases like these but it is as much about the character of the individuals involved. Because whatever the wishes of those in power, in fact, everybody has a choice in these situations. They could, as a few have done, stand up for what was right. They could protest against the leader's abuse of power and the steady erosion of MPs' prerogatives that made it possible, or they could choose to pile on and collude in their own servitude. It is a familiar tale, of course, that so many people choose to go along not only accepting the indignity of their own station, but attacking anyone who tries to improve theirs is wholly comprehensible. The seductiveness of compromise, the desire to be realistic, the pressure to conform, the fear of retribution, the comfort of the status quo, all conspired to condemn and discredit the purist who wonders, as in this case, whether MPs were really intended to be pack animals or if they have just allowed themselves to become so. Aaron, the suggestion here is that it's their fault. They can fix this and they won't. Is he right? It is to a certain degree. I, you know, I take the MPs criticisms to heart, that it is the media's fault to a certain degree that we tend to blow these things up and, and start worrying about... Which you do. This is, that's our job to a certain degree. Uh, mm. it, you know, we, we blow these things up as, as questions mm. of leadership. Uh, but I think, uh, I think you've seen a bit on this issue that it, there has been a bit uh, of a perspective here. You know, it's silly that we've gotten to this point. We're talking about the 15 minutes set aside before question period for MPs to stand up and talk about bake sales and old people in their writings. Or with abortion or with, capital punishment, heavy issues too. Sure, by all means, but it's 60 seconds they get mm -hmm. for uh, you know 15 MPs, 60 seconds each. This is the smallest, least significant part of the day in many ways. And we've, we've gotten somehow to this point where this matters, where we now have to ask whether MPs should have permission to stand up during that time or whether they need to go through their party whips. You know, it, we're not, I don't, I don't think you can ever argue for 308 independents. Uh, you know, the parties are there for a reason, but it's a question of balance at some point, and at this point there is no balance. Uh, and so that's where we need to get back, and that goes for, for uh, the media and MPs. You know, to get back to your question, yeah, this is on MPs. Uh, there are 308 of them. Uh, if they want to change the House, they can go ahead and do so. Um, they, just have to have, they just have to have a touch of courage. A touch of courage. Well, having said that, Allison, wh how about the media makes an agreement that the next time somebody wants to speak offside from what the party position is, the media don't report it as a lack of leadership ability in the leader. The media don't report it as, oh my goodness, the, the, you know, the sky is falling, we're all going to hell in a handcart. Is that possible also? I'm, I think it could, well, who knows? It just in the same way that the MP... Andrew and Aaron both encourage MPs to take more responsibility. I think the media could do the same. In the same uh, interview, I think that Nathan mentioned earlier, uh, Andrew Coyne did also acknowledge that the media could play a larger role there. So we at least have two, and perhaps if you would join, there's three that would agree with that. <laughs> um, but there's a, another point. I, I, I actually agree as well with with Andrew that uh, you know I think we need to do more to illuminate the role of the MP and their responsibilities. Uh, it is still uh, though important to understand the structural constraints that exist around them. Uh, one of the uh, really surprising things that I learned from doing the exit interviews was how many different ways the MP MPs talked about how to express dissent. Um, so we almost, there was almost like a ladder of dissent. So the you know, bare minimum is that you sort of say something in caucus and nobody knows about it, but you've done your bit uh, through to committees and all the way up to the most public venue, which is the House of Commons. And you know, the ultimate is to just not decide to vote with your party. Some just opt not to show up for votes. So there's a whole myriad of ways that MPs could dissent or do dissent. We don't always know. Um, and some of them come with very harsh punishments. Uh, some of them just go unspoken of. So the MPs themselves are confused, but okay, if I disagree with something what's the appropriate way to go about that um, so well, I think there are some structural issues too I, I think it's the other aspect of the pack animal that Andrew isn't getting is that if there's 40 of you within caucus 
who all feel strongly about something, you can go to the prime minister. And, and, and certainly we did that on the Endangered Species Bill. There were 40 of us, Women's Caucus, Karen Crassloan, Charles Cassia, that, that said we will not support a bill that does not protect habitat. Sorry, who did you do that to? To the prime minister. Which and, one? Uh, Jean Chrétien. You and, went we, to him? And, and we went to him and we said we can't support this bill. And I said I had a town hall meeting. I promised my people I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for anything that didn't protect habitat. What did he say? He thanked me for sharing, um, but then it was quite clear that they, they ragged out that bill for almost a year and then put in the amendments that protected habitat. Because free votes don't mean that I really want to stand up and vote against my party. Free, free votes mean I want to use my leverage to be able to get the better bill that I think the people in my riding want. Which you think and in the end you got. We did, and we did on pay equity, we did on not going into Iraq, we did on, I mean, this is a, this is, you know, what does caucus think? Um, as Jean Chrétien's sort of mantra, and I, and I think, you know, I got into trouble on the hep C vote, because I was so new, I didn't know I needed to get 40 people with me. Uh, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot to be said about that. And I also think that if we go back to committees and, you know, we'll see um, what Brent thinks about, you know, the fact that there were no amendments on that recent bill on the North, that when I sp spoke on it in the House, one of his colleagues said, oh, we can't effect, uh, allow amendments because the opposition would beat us up and say we didn't know what we were doing. You're well, going, hang on. Let oh, me try my this. word. Let me try like, this with Nathan Cullen, first of all. The, the Conservatives have put out some numbers, Nathan, suggesting that, in, in fact, they have more people voting offside from their quote-unquote party position than either of the other two parties, or three parties, I guess. Well, the Greens can't be offside. They only got one vote. But, but if the, it, they, I think they said that the NDP voted lockstep with the leader and with the party position, all members, I think 100% of the time. And the suggestion no. was there's more democracy in the Conservative Party than there therefore is in the NDP party. What's your reaction? No, we, we had, yeah, we had some members vote against the party, but the, <laughs> the interesting thing about that analysis, because I actually looked at the numbers behind it, is that somebody who was seen as a dissenter, somebody who wasn't lockstep, some of these Conservatives that you talk about in some cases and others, had voted 99.6% of the time with the party. So they were the dissenters. <laughs> so we're not talking about an enormous amount of dissension. I, I think sometimes I, I take a lot of Brent's points about how to, how to have more of a democratic representation. I'd be a bit careful about the American analogies, only because the system is so different there in terms of the bipartisan support for bills and the ability to hang money on bills. I look to the British model sometimes as a, a bit of a light. They've had to, uh, because of scandal, mostly spending and then wiretapping and a bunch of scandals that Parliament has gone through. And I hope we don't have to go through the same thing for some reform. But they've opened up the idea that, that MPs from the governing party ask some of the toughest questions of government in terms of that holding people to the account. I guess my central point is that when I go to the doorsteps in between elections and then during an actual campaign, there, we, maybe it's the fault of the parties, maybe it's the fault of the media, but I don't get a lot of people raising the particular topic we're talking about today as the thing that's going to determine their vote. The management of the economy, protection of the environment, First Nations issues, and I think the work that we need to engage ourselves in, and I think Allison is, is doing fantastic work on this, is to make this issue matter more to Canadians, which I think it does as, yes, this is important, but is it a vote-determining issue? And if it becomes that, then of course the parties will respond in a free market democratic society that we run. The best idea that has the most traction with voters tends to sway the parties in that direction. And if we can have something about democratic renewal be on the ballot, be a central ballot question in the next election through all of these efforts, then I think Parliament will do better. I think individual MPs will do better. I think Canada will do much better because we've said this matters. The parties, if they're smart, will respond because it's showing up again and again in polls and on the doorstep. And then you've got the real momentum behind this thing to say that it is going to change and it is going to get so much for the better for all involved. Well, let me go back to Carolyn yeah. Bennett on this because 10 years ago you co-chaired a study in Parliament saying this... What was it called? The Parliament We Want. Yes. And you had a bunch of recommendations in there for, yes. for getting Parliament how quote, to unquote, hold government to account, how to make committees work better. I, I mean, that was that ten gone? years ago. Yeah, not so, not so well, Steve. Anything and, happened from that? <laughs> um, I don't think so. I mean, we've gone backwards so in terms back of even the kind of 
digital. I mean, we've still only got a couple of committees televised. We've only got we we don't have websites or interactive websites for committees. So how do we get things back on track? Well, one of the things we have to deal with in the difference between the American system and the British system is what looks like party discipline is career discipline, and the chance that you're going to cabinet is, I think, one of the biggest disciplines around, as people all think that if they're good little boys and girls, that they're going to end up in cabinet. That does not happen in the United States unless you're Hillary Clinton, and it, <laughs> you've got a pretty slim chance of doing that. And so what we did say in that in report UK, is that the two way of inclusion in policy development as well as holding government to account, that the two track of being the, the encyclopedic member of the transport committee or the very best committee chair anybody's ever seen, that pe people saw that as a as a great job in parliament and and now you know it's it's like you're either in cabinet or you're a, a nobody and i'm afraid that watching those people on the talk shows on at five o'clock every day reading the, the talking points i i don't know how they look themselves in the mirror in the morning well let, let me find out from brent rathgaber i i you know. You know, you're not in cabinet. I presume you'd like to be in cabinet someday, and I wonder whether you worry that if you get offside from the prime minister's office or the whip too much, you're affecting your chances of ever having that happen. Well, actually, I don't aspire to be in cabinet, and I, I absolutely agree with everything Dr. Bennett said. If a person, if a person's role in going to Ottawa is to be upwardly mobile, uh, they'll take a much different route than I'm doing with respect to my blogging and with respect to speaking out against government policies from time to time that I might not agree with, or defending the member's right to, to speak freely. But she's absolutely right. And with cabinets having grown as large as they have, I think there's 38 members now and about half as many parliamentary secretaries, uh, you know, that's a third of the caucus has uh, an increment to their salary and an increment to their prestige, at least theoretically, b by being part of the team, so so called. But I didn't run for cabinet. I didn't run for parliamentary secretary. I ran for parliament, and I believe that in and of itself is important. That parliament has a role in a speaking out on behalf of one's constituents and bringing matters of importance to Ottawa, but more significantly and constitutionally holding government to account. I believe that that is the role of the legislative branch to hold the executive branch to account and that and I think I think that's not particularly well understood both in the public and certainly even among members of parliament. So I, I believe that we have an educational goal here and that is to to reconvince both members of parliament and to uh, to a greater extent the public that being a member of parliament is important in and of itself not just a stepping stone to the front bench and, and once we reestablish that th then i believe that they'll you'll see a greater role for parliament and members speaking freely in holding members to account or hold, sorry holding government to account aaron how do we get this thing back on track there's a bit of, you know, when, they, when we start talking about the public and democratic renewal, you get into a bit of a chicken, or a chicken and the egg argument. You know, whether we need to renew democracy to get the public involved or whether we need to get the public interested to renew, renew democracy. democracy. So let's call that a tie. The moment that we have right now is that Mark Warwa has kicked open the door a bit to have this discussion about something as simple as what the whips are in con our control within Parliament. So. Parliament's off right now. They get back next week. Every MP in that place has a chance to get up and say something about this. And then the Speaker has a chance to make a decision that will possibly lead to change. Do we know whether he'll make that decision public day one that they get back? I would, I would be shocked if he did it that quickly. I think they'll probably hear from a few more voices on this. Okay. Uh, but then we have two years uh, where MPs have a chance to start making some small changes around the edges. Uh, and if these small changes start coming in, maybe we see more people with blogs. Maybe we see more statements in the House that are a bit more interesting. You know, maybe we see some bills come up that are a bit more interesting. And, and maybe that leads to something. But you need to start making very small little changes to the way Parliament works to get this thing going. You know, there's no, there's no big grand answer. There's no big hmm. grand bargain here to be made. It is small little changes that can start moving this back in the right direction. Okay, just a few minutes left. Alison Lowe, how do you get this back on track? I agree entirely. Uh, over the month of February, we uh, led a discussion and we had over 100 people submit ideas on how to redesign Parliament so it's relevant. 
and there are a bunch that are sort of interesting. Some are architectural in nature. Um, you know, it seems a little silly that 308 people are sitting in one room trying to make decisions, looking across, and you know, what if we thought about redesigning into a circle or thinking of other ways that are a little more modern. Um, respecting, of course, we have a parliamentary tradition, but maybe so some of them were like that. Um, some of them were structural and tough and are going to take forever, even things like updating the Elections Act to remove parties, leaders, the leader of uh, parties ability to sign nomination papers. That's very commonly mentioned. So MPs can feel more free uh, to say what they want. But the most compelling ones to me are exactly the ones that Aaron talked about. The small changes that MPs can do tomorrow. Um, say no to uh, the talking points when, you're, when they're received and say something interesting and original. Um, people might start listening. And so those are the ones that seem to me to be the most compelling and they're probably going to slowly reverse that decline if, uh, if uh, probably 150 or so MPs commit to them. Nathan Cullen, could you sign on to that? Sign on to the idea, uh, which, which part of Aaron's ideas, Allison's, I mean, there's was, there was a bunch put on. Baby steps, baby steps to, oh. uh, to uh, increase the sure. individual power of the member of parliament to get away from the, the crack of the whip and uh, make the place more responsive to the needs of Canadians. Well, this, this is, I mean, we, I referred to it before as the house leader for the official opposition. We don't vet the statements that are coming forward. <laughs> Aaron mentioned that. Uh, from time to time, we, we use the very last statement we have. And we had an interesting tactic, which I thought was mm, somewhat successful, is that the day before, when a, if a government member had gotten up and used the usual uh, PMO talking points to attack us, the next day we would get up and we would mention that member's riding, but not in a very aggressive way. We would just talk about events that were going on in the Yukon or Kitchener or wherever the Conservative had come from. And I had a number of them come across to me afterwards in the back quarters of Parliament and say, well done. That was kind of effective. I feel bad that my statement was about Thomas Mulcair as opposed to about my home. I think we started a civility project out of my office to talk about how just basic decorum needs to improve in order to have democracy uh, have a better shot. And civility seems to be at, at least at the heart of some of the things we're talking about. Finally, just in, in terms of the, the small steps and the freeing up of MPs, I think this is an absolutely essential conversation. It was something I raised in my leadership campaign. I know it's been somewhat addressed in the Liberal one as well, and I think it has to get on the ballot. I guess that was my point earlier. If it, if it doesn't feel like it's one of those burning issues that people are making their decisions as to who to vote for based on commitments made by the different parties, the leaders, and their individual members, then if that, that is the currency that we do play with here at the end of the day, and that is a joint project. I really do believe it's certainly the MPs moving these small steps. I think media not seeing everything as a, a crack in leadership and a total destruction of the party and the leader himself, uh, and, and as well the public saying that this matters as much to me because it affects every issue that I care about. Because if my MP can't speak, if I can't feel like I'm connected to my parliament and to my countries, leadership, then whether it's the environment or the economy or international affairs, all of those things are affected. Gotcha. We got to go. Thanks, everybody, for this discussion today. Brent Rathgaber, the Conservative member in Edmonton, St. Albert. Nathan Cullen, the NDP member from Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Carolyn Bennett, the Liberal member from right here in St. Paul's. Aaron Wary, the parliamentary reporter for McLean's Magazine. And Alison Lote, the co-founder and executive director of Samara. Thanks, everybody, for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.